the ownership of the means of production by the proletariat. I'd like to start, <coughs> uh, start with a question. Um, Karl Marx, did he have a clue? And if I continue to step on this drain cover, it's going to creep all the way through my talk, so I'll stand over okay. here. Um, well, uh, as most people know, of course, what he, his, the central tenant of what he had to say was that rich people can own factories that make stuff to sell, so they get richer. Uh, the proletariat can only sell their labour, so they stay poor. Now, this is substantially correct. Of course, there are counter examples. One or two people start with nothing and rise to fabulous riches, uh, but that's the exception, not the rule. Um, um, sorry? Mostly bankers. Well, no, many bankers, of course, have been in the industry for generations, so they don't actually fall into the category I just described. But um, anyway, uh, this not only works at the individual level, if we, it works right the way up to nation states. We can see that the most impoverished nation states have an enormous uh, difficulty uh, getting themselves off the ground and, and on the path to prosperity. Um, so, as I say, that's a substantially correct uh, assertion. Um, and then we went on to say that the solution to this problem is for the proletariat to seize the factories, uh, the means of production by revolution. Um, this is a good candidate, of course, for the all-time worst idea in human history. Uh, whenever it's applied, uh, the only thing that gets produced um, is not wealth, it's corpses. Uh, indeed, you can lay more corpses to the door of this time here in the 20th century than even to the door of fascism. So uh, it turns out that that, so that gets it. Uh, not correct. And finally, he said that uh, he predicted that the revolution will happen in the first and most industrial advanced nation, which at the time he said in the middle of the 19th century, which was Britain. Um, uh, again, wrong. Uh, if you look at Marxist revolutions, they tend to happen in societies that are making a transition from an agrarian to an industrial economy, not the most industri advanced industrial economies. Um, so, 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 Marx is Marx with 33%. Um, <laughs> Many of us here are academics, or in my case, ex-academics, that wouldn't get him a degree in uh, any respectable university. Uh, nonetheless, he did have that right thing to say, so just bear that in the back of your mind while I actually go on to talk about what I'm supposed to be here to talk about, uh, which is uh, Red Rap, and that's a picture of a machine, as you can see. Uh, Red Rap is a, is a 3D printer, which all the rage. Indeed, Red Rap is one of the reasons why they're all the rage, and I'll perhaps address that in a little while. Um, but the important thing about RepRap is not that it makes solid objects in an extremely versatile way, which all 3D printers do, but that it's designed to self-replicate. Uh, that's a picture, in fact, of a RepRap machine, a small one, to give you some idea of scale, that the machine you can see in that picture is about so big. Um, and uh, it's just printed a complete set of the plastic parts that go to make another one of itself. Um, it doesn't print every last bit of itself, and we'll see that in a moment, but uh, it prints a substantial fraction of its own uh, component parts. Um, so, having said that, let's look at a few numbers and facts about the machine. Uh, in fact, it can copy about half of its own parts. If you've got a pile of bits on the bench in front of you, you're going to assemble it into a machine, half of them would have been printed by another one of these machines. Almost as importantly as the half of the parts that compose it uh, that it prints itself, is the other half, and the fact that right from the beginning of the project, they were designed as much as possible to be very widely available. Indeed, the vast majority of the bits and pieces of the machine you can buy in an ordinary b &Q hardware shop. Um, one or two of them are a bit specialist, the motors, the electronics, and so on, but there are multiple sources for those online worldwide. Um, the reason why that's important, of course, is that if you're going to put the machine together, you're going to have it replicate itself, uh, you don't want it to be composed of a load of obscure and difficult to obtain parts because that's not going to be very successful in terms of self-copying. If everything's really easy to get, uh, if you like, it's like having an abundant source of food for a living organism, uh, it's uh, very much easier for it to reproduce itself. Um, when I started this project, uh, the project to make a self-replicating 3D printer, uh, it was a long time ago now, nine years, 2004. Um, and the lowest cost 3D printing machine you could get at the time was between 50 and 20,000 pounds. Um, you can put a rep machine together for about 300 quid, so we knocked a bit of a hole in that market. Um, typical sort of size, well, I, I wave my hands about to show you the size of the machine. Uh, there's a slightly larger model machine about this big. Um, the working volume, the size of the biggest thing that it can create, is a 200 by 200 by 140 millimeters. 
Um, uh, it's pretty easy to make larger objects, though you just chop them up, print them separately, and then stick them together. Um, and indeed, uh, that's a pretty common activity. But what materials can it work with? Well, we'll, we'll see a range of those in a little bit later on. But fundamentally, most plastics, most thermoplastics, I mean plastics that melt and then refreeze multiple times when you want them to. Um, uh, typically, uh, for example, plastics like ABS, which is the plastic that Lego bricks are made from, uh, PLA, polylactic acid, R7 is a good one that I've been trying to do. Um, the sort of print rate that you can get out of the machine, it's not all that fast at making things. It'll lay down about 30 milliliters per hour of, of plastic to make objects. Um, to put that in perspective, that means that if you want to make a copy of the machine, it takes less than a day in the machine itself. Uh, so, in terms of, and in, incidentally, it takes about a day if you know what you're doing to put one of these machines together. So, you could be printing one, putting the previous one together. Uh, so, one day replication time. In other words, in terms of replication, a bit slower than a bacteria, a bit faster than a mouse. Um, so, um, so, that puts it somewhere on the scale of these things. Um, and the license under which it's distributed, this is not an engineering fact, this is a socio-political, stroke economic fact. Um, uh, I put it out under the GPL when I first started the project. Uh, as you all know, indeed, probably many of you know much better than I, there are more open source licenses than there are humans on Earth. Um, but um, from the perspective of the vast majority of those humans, they all mean the same thing. Um, basically, it's free, you know, we like it. Um, the GPL, of course, has conditions themselves about these things are concerned with. Um, but we put it out under the GPL because one of those conditions that the GPL imposes is that if you can make any improvements, you've got to put it, your improvements out under a compatible license. And it seemed to me that if people were going to redesign the machine, it would be quite nice if those redesigns were available uh, under a similar license to the license which we originally distributed the machine under. And indeed, the machine I showed you at the beginning. Uh, what sort of things does it make? Uh, not quite quicker to list the things it doesn't make, but um, it'll make an enormous range of items. Uh, there are websites, uh, principal one among which is a website called Thingiverse, which you might remember some of you may know about, uh, where you can upload 3D printed object designs for people to download and print them in the machines and other 3D printers. Uh, top left, what's going on there? Well, in the shower tray in the bathroom. Uh, they could have driven all the way down to the shop and bought a new drain and then put it in, but they just sell them and printed it. It took about two hours to print. They didn't have to spend those two hours, of course, they could go away and have lunch with the book or um, A little quadcopter in the middle at the top there uh, with, a, with a video camera attached. All the black bits of that were printed in the wrap wrap machine. Um, uh, and, uh, I'll fly around and take pictures for you. That's a legitimate activity or not. It depends upon what you're taking pictures of. Um, very simple things. Little drawers that stick together to form bigger stacks of drawers so you can put components in. Uh, bottom left, there's a, a, a little robot that follows a, a white line into the floor, the sort of thing you might make in any secondary school science or any or technology project. Um, all the more mechanical parts of that were printed in that machine. Um, it, in the middle there, uh, Gothic Cathedral, um, that wasn't printed in one shot, that was printed in sections and then stuck together. Um, uh, bottom right, uh, that's actually something I did, which is a pair of children's shoes, as you can see. Um, I mentioned the machine works with a range of plastics. Those are actually printed in HDPE, which is the plastic they made, not quite as art of. Um, and uh, one of the things that people are working on is making a regrinder so you can grind your own plastic waste and then feed it into the machine and print useful things with it uh, in order to avoid having recycling trucks arrive and drive your plastic away to be put in a container and shipped to China to be sorted and then shipped to America to be reground into plastic and then uh, this is not actually all that environmentally friendly way of recycling but if you can grind your own plastic and print things useful for yourself, like old pop bottles, uh, then that cuts out all that transport of recycling. Uh, in the case of children's shoes, of course, um, uh, many of you will have children and you'll know that children's feet 
inconveniently grow in an annoying manner. Um, of course, if you've got a design for a pair of sandals, you can print it yourself. Uh, when your children are broken, you just chuck them into the re grinder, throw it in an extra milk bottle, scale the redrive by one. And then you can Um This next item is, is my personal all time favourite thing printed in a rep rap machine. Um, Somebody put a design on Thingiverse for seashells. It was a parametric design, so you can change it back into three, three numbers that form the parameters, three, three, four numbers. Um, and uh, by changing those numbers, you can change the length of the shell, the number of spirals, how squishy it is, how wide it is, and so on. Um, anyway, uh, somebody else then downloaded this and, and printed out a load of shells. And they knew that they were going diving in a couple of weeks' time, and they were going out in the boat before they were diving, so they just went out in their boat and chucked them over the side, and then when they went diving, they took a photograph of who'd taken that present. So, Red Rap has solved the housing shortage. Just <laughs> 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 not, not for people. Um, now, when I started the project, I had no idea that people would want to make artificial plastic homes for hermit crabs. <laughs> not only did I have no idea of such a thing, of course, not a single industrial company anywhere on earth had such an idea. So, oh, we've got a really good marketing idea. We're going to make plastic seashells and sell them to people for three pence each, and they can throw them over the side of the boat. Nobody had that idea. And of course, anybody who had had that idea probably wouldn't have got a great deal of financial backing for it. But yet, here's someone who had it made it work, not an economic activity at all, just something that gave it both, and presumably gave her much credit as well. Um, okay, I just want to move away from RepRap specifically for the moment to say a few words about why 3D printing is such a powerful way to make stuff. Um, there's been a great deal, of course, in the press about 3D printing, uh, including in some of the more technical press, like magazines like New Scientist and so on. Um, but and, and many of those items, or some of those items in the press, have been used sort of with journalists who talk to me. Um, every time I get the chance to tell a journalist I do about why this is an important technology, and they never ever print what I say. <laughs> and the reason is because it involves mathematics. And of course, if there's one thing that will never get into any journalistic article, it's in a piece of mathematics. Um, However, oh, this is a British computer society, so. Uh, Say we talk a little bit about mathematics without getting too frightened. Um, well, let's look at some reasons why it might be such a powerful way to make stuff. Is it fast? Well, the answer to that is no. Um, if you have ever seen an injection molding machine working, the sort of thing that makes combs and uh, toothbrushes and so on, uh, they can spit parts out at the rate of, well, they'll stamp out 50 parts every shot, uh, and you, you'll get those 50 once every two or three seconds. Uh, for every one item that comes out in a uh, Printed the second order of digital injection molding machine effectively might all take an hour to print in 3D print. So this is not a fast technology, not a fast way of making things. Is it cheap? Well, I said the machines are cheap, and that's certainly true now that RepRap started and brought the price of a lot of these machines down. Uh, it was the first of the low-cost machines, and many have come along after it based on the RepRap technology. Though they're not self-replicating, so it'll be machines designed using the same sort of techniques. Um, uh, now, those machines themselves, the capital cost is not great for them, but uh, as a way of making stuff, it is actually more expensive than injection molding, um, which is the music <coughs> that you when you pull a Christmas cracker, the thing that drops out of it is made in an injection molding machine, not in a 3D printer. Um, in order to see why this is such a powerful way to make stuff, we have to ask a second question, which is, how can the shape of stuff be complicated? Uh, it turns out, and I'm indebted to my old colleague John Woodup for this diagram, uh, that there are actually three ways in which the shapes of things, and here we're talking about the shapes of things you might want to make, are complicated. Um, the first way is the way that, uh, as computer people are all used to, is the combinatorial complexity. Um, if your shape has uh, three sides, like a triangle, uh, it's combinatorially fairly straightforward. If it's got three, 300 sides, like a gear wheel, uh, it's combinatorially much more complicated. There's just more data there to, to represent the shape because it's fiddly bits. Um, 
But there are two other ways in which shapes can be complicated as well. The second way is analytical complexity. Uh, triangles made up of straight lines. Uh, we can have higher degree equations, of course, describing fancy curved surfaces in space. Um, and the more higher the degree gets, and the more fancy the algebra gets, the more analytically complicated the shape effectively becomes. And that's entirely independent of combinatorial complexity. We would have a shape which only had two surfaces, where each surface was analytically extremely common. And finally, and as we shall see in a moment, most importantly, there's dimensional complexity. The triangle is a two-dimensional thing. Uh, the gear wheel will have some thickness, of course, but it's effectively a two-dimensional thing. Um, the tetrahedron at the back here is a three-dimensional object. Um, this funny curly shape here is three-dimensional brick walls, three-dimensional objects. This other funny curly shape here is three-dimensional object. Now, as any of you have ever done any computer programming with any sort of geometrical calculations as well will know, the real killer when it comes to complexity of shape is dimensional complexity. As you increase the number of dimensions that you're trying to work in inside a computer, or indeed inside your head, things get very difficult very, very fast. And this is because things don't just change in degree as the number of dimensions change, they change in kind. A couple of examples, uh, as you uh, all immediately see, if you've got points arranged around a circle, you can sort them into order if you go around the circle. You've got points sitting on the surface of the three-dimensional sphere, there's no natural ordering for them. You can't say this one comes before that one. Um, in two dimensions, uh, you can have a piece of string, and whatever you do, you can't tie a knot in it. As any kitten will be able to demonstrate that you can't tie a knot in a piece of string in three dimensions. Um, so dimensional complexity is the killer. So if we look at 3D printing compared to the conventional way in which human beings have to make stuff, which is by cutting things out, by taking a block and carving it away, now, I mentioned the injection molding before, you say, hang on, that's not cutting things out kind of way. Well, it is, because you've got to make the mold. Injection mold, any sort of molding is a secondary process, the primary process, the thing that makes the mold is that you've got to worry about the complexity. Um, let's suppose you've got the, the, the object on the, on the picture on the left there, which is uh, an impeller blade from a turbocharger <coughs> motor car. And we've got a solid block, and we want to cut that shape out of it. Um, the object with the cone there and the yellow tip is a cutting tool, uh, which is going to move around in space and cut this object out. Um, <coughs> and it has, as it does any object moving around in space, six degrees of freedom, of course. Uh, it can move left, right, front, back, up and down, and it can also rotate about all those axes. Now, when you come to figure out how to move the cutting tool about, it turns out that you don't have to solve a six-dimensional problem, which would be horrendous, you only have to solve a five-dimensional problem because one of the dimensions of rotation turns out to be mapped onto the axis down the middle of the cutting tool and then you can forget it. Um, but uh, it's a five-dimensional problem. You're effectively trying to figure out a piece of five-dimensional geometry in what's called the configuration space, configuration space of the cutting tool. And that is extraordinarily difficult. Indeed, it's so difficult that no solutions for every possible shape exist. We know and there are lots of machines like this out in the world making stuff, we know that for all of those machines, there are actual shapes that we could design and that the machine is perfectly capable of cutting out, but we simply can't write the software to figure out how to do it. They're quite complicated shapes, but nonetheless, it can't be done. So, suddenly, we've got a machine, an incredibly powerful cutting out machine, but the machine is limited not by what its physics can do in terms of moving around and cutting, but how hard our computers, or indeed we, can think about the problem of how to cut things out. And there's another problem which has to be solved as well, which is that, of course, as the yellow cutting tool is moving around, trying to cut the shape out, we have to worry about the fact that the big conical thing attaching it to the rest of the machine mustn't collide with anything, even though we're not really paying attention to that, we're much more concerned with the yellow bit that's doing the cutting. And so there's the collision problem which has to be worried about as well. A very difficult problem, one for which, as yet, we have no complete, perfect, algorithmic solution that actually works. And so our cutting machine tools are not quite as versatile as their physics should allow them to be. If we now look at three-dimensional printing, that works layer by layer. It's very straightforward. We lay down a thin layer of material, and we then move up, we lay down the next layer of the object that we're making, and we keep on going, building a stack until we finish. And of course, we make the layers very thin so that we don't get a lot of staircases as we go up the side of the object. 
Uh, no, inevitably you will get some sort of staircase. Any method of digital control is obviously going to have some sort of aliasing effect to make an object. Um, now we take our turbine blade, and of course the problem which we have to solve at each stage of the process reduces to simply dealing with a slice two-dimensional problem. Suddenly a five-dimensional problem has become a two-dimensional problem. It's a problem you can always solve. Basically it's the same sort of straightforward software that goes into programs like Photoshop and it will be two-dimensional things as well, pictures. Um, and so now, for the first time, we've actually got a machine where we can make it do everything that its physics will allow us to do. It has constraints, of course, it has constraints of accuracy, temperatures, all sorts of other things, but those are all physical constraints that we can't ever go beyond for a given machine. Everything the machine can do, we can do with it. What's more, the collision problem has also gone away as well. And the reason is because we're building flat surfaces, one stacked on top of the other, at every stage, um, as we move around, we've got complete freedom of movement because the bit that's going to stick up isn't there yet. So we don't have to care about the machine colliding with bits of the thing that we're going to be making. Um, and for that reason, 3D printing can make objects that no other technology is capable of making. And that's the reason for its power. No other technology we currently do. Um, there is a piece of technology that we sort of don't have that's capable of making things even more complicated, and that's growing. In other words, cells reproducing and assembling themselves into livers and blood vessels and all that sort of stuff. Something we're starting to get into, but nonetheless, not really available. Okay, but let's go back to the software application now, having briefly introduced a bit of biological flavor into what I was saying. Um, anyone with a RepRap can make another RepRap for a friend. The open source license permits them to do that. They can download all the information they need, the software for the computer that sits on the machine and drives it, all the CAD designs, the computer aided design files for the bits and pieces of the machine, everything they need. Uh, and if you've got one machine, you can then make another. Uh, that is a picture of me on the left. Uh, and uh, a chap on the Rat Rat project from New Zealand called Vic Oliver on the right. And this, on the 29th of May 2008, is the first time the machine made a copy of itself. Um, as you can see, the machine design back then was different from the one I showed at the very beginning of the talk. That was the very first machine. We called that machine Darwin. They're all named after biologists. Biology is the study of things that copy themselves. Um, the first question, obviously, arises in your mind is the chicken egg one. How did you make the first machine? Well, the answer is we used a very expensive commercial 3D printer, which the British government and taxpayer had kindly bought from my university. Um, <laughs> and um, having done that, uh, the second machine was rather cheap to make uh, because we made it in the first. And we put it all together on the 29th of May 2008 uh, and started up and it failed. <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, the reason it didn't work was because you may just be able to see it, but certainly those are the front row canvas, that there's a belt that runs around here which drives the vertical movement of the machine. And being extremely stupid men, uh, we cut it too long, uh, so it was too slack and it didn't drive the machine properly. But we discovered very quickly that if we simply rested a screwdriver against it, um, the machine worked fine. So what we did was we sat down, we designed a little belt pensioning mechanism, uh, we held the screwdriver against the belt, had the machine print out that tensioning mechanism, fitted it to the machine, and then it worked perfectly. <laughs> so not only was it the first child machine, it made its own first grandfather child part and fixed itself as its very first action. And of course, with self-replication, self-repair sort of comes for free. If you've got a machine, they're particularly paranoid amongst the owners of these machines, the first thing they do with it is they print out a spare set of parts, put them in a cardboard box for when something breaks. Um, it's all a bit like MP3 music sharing, but for real small stuff. That, that's a rep rep printed pan and tilt mechanism for a webcam. Um, and I talked about plastics, but really we're talking about, well, maybe not any stuff, but an awful lot of stuff. And here's an example of the sort of thing I mean when we start moving away from plastics. Uh, that's actually a picture of a, a microcontroller. It's a cut down Arduino. Uh, one of the standard RepRap microcontrollers is an Arduino. Uh, so this is effectively the machine actually printing out a piece of electronics. <coughs> um, 
ignore the diagonal lines for the moment. You can see the silvery bits there. Uh, those are the result of running an experimental metal printing head in the machine to lay down circuit tracks. Of course, it can't make the chips yet, um, <laughs> but it can make uh, a solid block with cavities in it. We can drop chips, we can drop components into those cavities. Uh, that's crystal, capacitors, resistors, um, LED, yeah. Um, and then connect them all up using the machine. You just have to pause the machine, drop the bits in, and then restart it. Uh, the diagonal lines, which I told you to ignore, are the machine now printing plastic over the top of what it's done just to tack everything down. Um, and so uh, we're starting to do electronics with the machine. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say my student got a PhD for that and other work he's done, done with the machine. Um, the Guardian said that RepRap has been called the invention that will bring down global capitalism, start a second industrial revolution, and save the environment. <laughs> well, that's the Guardian. Is <laughs> 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 that a quote? <laughs> uh, it may be. A, well, that's a quote from the Guardian. No, no, what was that one of your quotes? Yeah, well, the journalist talked to me. I did not say any of those. I mentioned, well, we'll come back to Karl Marx in a minute. I just mentioned the ideas that I'm going to go back to in a moment. And so naturally, in terms of journalistic exaggeration, that turned into bringing down global capitalism. Um, I said that the process was very important, and his eyes glazed over as I went to see some of yours. When I went through that mathematical argument that I just, just outlined, um, and so that was starting a second industrial revolution because if it's mathematical, it must be important. Um, and say, well, we're coming to the environment. Um, here it is. Um, if you do the sums, uh, a rep rep machine works 100 watts or so, depends on the size of the machine, how hard it's working. Uh, if you do all the sums and figure out what's going up the smokestack of the power station down the road, it's 8 grams of carbon per hour when the machine's running. Uh, this doesn't, of course, include the figure for the carbon uh, that went into the electronics and the steel parts of the machine. We're just talking about running at the moment. Um, but it's laying down 25 grams of carbon per hour because it builds up many of the plastics across. Um, and what this means is that if you use a plastic that has been grown, as opposed to one derived from oil feedstock, um, you're effectively taking carbon out of the air all the time of running the machine. Um, in fact, you're taking about 17 grams of carbon per hour out of the air, give or take. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, we looked into using a plant-based plastic called polylactic acid, I mentioned that before, chemical structures down the bottom there, um, uh, in the machine. And it, rather than dig to, it turned out that it was actually one of the very best plastics from the perspective of its physical properties we use in this process. Um, and so uh, the vast majority of red machines run on polylactic acid, uh, and all that polylactic acid is made from starch, the reason I've shown corn cob there, um, particularly made it out of potatoes. Indeed, we've made it ourselves in the lab. Um, it, it's not horrendously difficult to make. Um, you need to take the starch and you need to ferment it to form lactic acid, which is just like brewing that process. Then the one difficult step, you have to take the lactic acid and get it very, very dry. And I don't just mean dry to the touch, I mean less than 10 parts per million water. Um, we did that in the lab simply just by dry it up. Uh, we conjecture, though we haven't done it, that you could probably dry it out sufficiently simply by blowing air, which has been passed over calcium, dry calcium chloride. Um, uh, that would probably dry down enough, though, unless you don't try that. Anyway, when you've got it very dry, you then mix a tiny, tiny 600, uh, 600 to 1 uh, tiny part of catalyst called tin octoy, cook it up to 140 degrees C, and it forms a foam for it. Um, so it really is kitchen chemistry. And of course, a consequence of all this is that not only have you got a machine uh, that copies itself, uh, copies half itself, I'll come back to that. Copies half itself, but you've also got a source of raw materials that copies itself as well. If you've got a few tens of square meters of that, you're completely self sufficient in raw materials for driving your machine and making stuff that you want to. Um, I said I'd come back to that question of the machine making about half of itself. Um, you're all living organisms, I think. Um, <laughs> how much of yourselves do you make? 
Anyone care to make a stab at a percentage? No, it's not. It's 60. Uh, your main proteins, proteins make machines that make other things, but the proteins are the important thing. Uh, proteins are made from 20 amino acids, of which you can make 12. We can all make 12. The other eight so-called essential amino acids, things you have to bring in from outside, just as red rat has to bring it, has to bring it itself. So 50% is not far short of the 60%, which we can do, making ourselves out of our campaign. Um, while we're on this sort of biological side, um, I thought I'd say a few words about uh, how the project started. Um, I actually uh, had the idea, not as a result of seeing a 3D printing machine and then saying, oh, let's make a self-replicating machine. Um, before I'd ever seen a 3D printing machine, I knew I'd be interested in self-replicating machines and the idea of self-replicating machines for because I can remember saying that about that life. Um, <clears throat> and a long time ago, I worked out that if you were going to make a self-replicating machine, it had to exhibit what the uh, biologists call an evolutionarily stable strategy. Uh, an evolutionarily stable strategy is a strategy that a living organism has, such that if it's perturbed a small amount away from its aesthetic position, its equilibrium position, mutation tends to, or even Darwinian selection tends to move it back to it. There are lots and lots of examples in the nature of this. Uh, and it's a special case of the Nash equilibrium and game theory. Um, uh, one example, for, uh, which I won't bother to go into in detail, is the uh, ratio in human or indeed animal populations of aggression to passivity, if I can say it right. Um, uh, hawks and doves, um, as you may well know, um, a population that consists of 100% doves the hawk mutation, when it arrives, has an enormous success because basically you can wipe the floor with all the dust. Um, slightly surprisingly, a population that consists of 100% hawks, the dove mutation has an advantage, basically because it doesn't spend all its time limping around being beaten up by other hawks. Um, it runs away. Um, and of course, if the two bits at the end uh, have a mutation which drives you away from those two end positions, there must be an equilibrium point to live there. There is such a thing. Anyway, if you're going to make a self-replicating machine, it immediately becomes subject to Darwin's law of evolution. And that means that if you're going to design it right, you want to make it so it exhibits an evolutionarily, evolutionarily stable strategy, otherwise it isn't going to succeed in the world. And I immediately went for a biological analogy, a biomimetic solution, in other words, copying nature solution. Uh, the analogy I went for was one provided 140 million years ago by the flowering plants when they first evolved. As you all know, we were all taught at school the flowering plants uh, had a symbiotic relationship with insects. Uh, Biologists don't call it symbiosis, they call it mutualism, but they stick with the common word symbiosis. Uh, we all know how this works. Um, the plants need to get their pollen to another plant, but plants, of course, can't move, so there's a bit of a problem there. Insects will move about, they don't care about pollen. Uh, so the plants make nectar, the insects visit the plants for nectar. Get meal, and uh, in doing so, uh, by chance, they take pollen from the plants, so the plants get fertilised, the plants get to reproduce, the insects get a meal, everybody's happy with the arrangement, and as I say, that, that arrangement first evolved 140 million years ago in the late Jurassic, and it's been going from strength to strength ever since, uh, despite the recent difficulty experienced by a few bees, and the lesson shows every sound of continuing. Red rat was actually designed to mimic that almost completely. Um, because, of course, it may fix parts for itself, but it doesn't assemble itself. Uh, I wasn't so interested in making a machine that both copied itself and assembled itself. The reason being was because I had 70, so, sorry, I had 7 billion assembly robots lying around on the face of the planet with nothing better to do than to put my machine together. Um, and so I thought I'd exploit them. Um, and the way to exploit them is in the same way as the uh, plants exploit the insects. Um, you give them a reward. Um, and what the machine does um, is it rewards people with other goods. It doesn't just copy itself. It makes useful goods for people, entertaining goods. Useful if you're a hermit crab, entertaining if you're a human being looking at the hermit crab. Um, and so people uh, have an incentive to make them help the machine to copy itself, just as the insects have an incentive to help the plants to copy themselves. 
And there's an exact, exact parallel here. Um, the flowers are like the red rap machine. The red rap machine makes goods, the flowers make nectar. The people come along and say, we want goods, we're going to help the red rap machine to cook it itself. Uh, the insects come along with the farms and say, we want nectar, we're going to help the flowers cook it themselves. Well, the insects don't think very much of the insects, but nonetheless, that's the effect of what they do. Um, so the whole thing was actually came up by that biomimetic analogy. And then when I finally did get to see a 3D printer about 15 years ago, uh, and even more so when my university acquired the rather expensive one that I mentioned earlier, um, I realised finally, because of that versatility I talked about, that reduction in the dimensional complexity of the problem of making things in the machine, finally we had a machine which had a sporting chance of actually being able to copy a, some, copy a significant fraction of itself. Well, going back to that Guardian quote, um, lots of people have said that this idea of these machines spread across the world and everybody's got the ability to make stuff themselves will destroy industry. Indeed, I've been accused of, of planning the destruction of industry, much to my delight and entertainment, as you can imagine. Um, I doubt it. It's not quite what I've lived all my life to be accused of, that it comes close. I, I've actually lived all my life waiting to be accused of being bourgeois. Nobody ever has, but, <laughs> uh, but nobody has said it. Uh, and of course, it doesn't count. I've said it, then you can say it question it, so that's if it's prompted, so that doesn't work. Um, anyway, uh, there's a picture of now, uh, sorry, here, not now, but uh, a long time ago, uh, about nine years before I was born. Um, I, I was born in London, and when I was growing up, uh, they cleared the rubber away, but there were lots of holes where the buildings used to be. Um, and this illustrates a problem we have with the world of destruction. When we talk about destruction, this is immediately the image that comes to our minds. But this is not extremely wicked activity you've got behind the buildings, of course, but it's not permanent destruction. Um, outside the window, that's what it looks like now. And in fact, that way of destroying things, breaking them, never works in the long term. Here's how to destroy things. Uh, everything on the left has been replaced by the items on the right. Uh, very few of you came here this evening, I suspect, in the Chromium Trap. Um, I bet you can all remember buying a roll of photographic film. Hands up, everybody can remember the last roll of photographic film you ever bought. One or two. Because, interestingly, in technical audiences, I always get about 10% hands up at that point because people like playing with film, like people like sailing boats. Uh, of course, if you want to go somewhere, you get in a boat with an engine. I bet even you, sir, who put your hand up occasionally take photos of your phone rather than the film. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, there's an entire industry that has been destroyed. We never even noticed that this industry was destroyed, incidentally, um, except for people who are unfortunate enough to work there. As it happened, it, the destruction of the photographic film industry occurred at a time of boom and high employment and so the large number of people who those people who put out work on this digital camera revolution uh, found jobs fairly easily elsewhere. If one of these destruction events happens when things are a bit uh, on their uppers and the economy the economy is not working so well, then people notice it far more. <coughs> um, yes, people were very worried of course of the move to motor cars introduced that all those experts on the care and management of horses were going to find themselves without jobs. Um, in fact, there's still quite a lot of horses around, but people just... The technologies don't disappear. They simply cease to be useful and become forms of entertainment. The same boat, uh, the horse, and so on and so on. Um, another aspect of this progress through time is this one. Um, again, this is something we're all taught at school, not at school, at university. Uh, the idea of an economy of scale. Um, here are two pictures of people making things. Um, on the left is a traditional blacksmith. Every village used to have one. Uh, and the blacksmith is his own human resources department, his own advertising department, uh, uh, his own tax accountant. Paid in tax, which is extremely improbable. Um, uh, and so on. So on. They had to be a jack of all trades in energy to be able to bash bits of iron in order to make horseshoes. Uh, for those horses that we no longer use industrially and, and uh, in a serious, serious manner. Um, of course, what happens is it turns out that if you've got the capital to invest, 
you can actually make a bigger thing and make it more efficient. Because of the Adam Smith idea of division of labour, you can take a large number of people, some of them are experts on bashing bits of metal to work on the floor there, some of them who know how to add columns and figures can do the accounts and so on and so forth, and the whole operation gets much more efficient, and the result is bigger and bigger factories there. Geographical relevance to the size of the factory can get, but um, how, how many of you have ever been to Wolfsburg in Germany, which is the Volkswagen town? Cornelia has. Um, I, I went there a couple of years ago, and uh, the taxi driver drove me from an airport some distance away, and we arrived in the outskirts of the town. And we drove to my destination, and after 10 minutes, I realized that we'd been driving along beside the same factory for 10 minutes. It was the Volkswagen Park. It's the size of a town. Uh, so the economies of scale really do get quite big um, when you follow them to their logical conclusion. But things don't always work that way. All of our grandparents, when they had dirty laundry, I used to pass it up and give it to someone who collected it from their door, and it would come back clean and ironed a few days later from the central laundry in town, which is top left there. Pass the back in the morning. The reason we don't do it in the morning is because we've got a robot in our kitchen that does it for us. It costs money. It costs two or three hundred quid, but the same cost as a red rack machine. Now, the really important thing about this robot, apart from the fact that it washes its clothes, not washes our clothes, is the fact that you don't care that it spends 95% of its time idle. You're perfectly happy to have that robot, that capital expenditure, 270 quid or whatever it cost you, sitting in your kitchen doing absolutely nothing, as long as occasionally when you come to it and sling some clothes and press the button, it spits them out, a bit damp, but washed some hours later. That's a reversal of economies of scale. When the means of doing something gets simple enough, cheap enough to use, that in order to have it for yourself, you don't care about the capital expenditure, you don't care about the fact that what you spent money on is not working for you most of the time, and you do care about the fact that it saves you having to go out of the door or wait two days for your laundry to come back, uh, you'll do it yourself. You won't do that. This completely breaks the whole idea of the economies of scale. Another example down the bottom here, all the electricity running the lights, computers and so on, is, uh, is being provided by one of those things on the left, sitting in here. Um, uh, I actually have, and I'm not supposed to have, so I'm not sure if I'm admitting something terrible here, I have an electricity meter in my house that turns slowly backwards when the sun shines. It's supposed to have a little rash on it, stops doing that for some reason. Um, <laughs> nothing to do with me. Uh, just the fact that people installed my solar panels, um, didn't spot the fact that I've got the wrong sort of meter. They should have changed it. Um, now it's the electricity company will tell me sooner or later when I put in readings that go slightly backwards every day. <laughs> um, anyway, <coughs> two gigawatts, four kilowatts, um, but millions of homes each with four kilowatts is a similar phenomenon to millions of homes with washing machines. We've taken what used to be an economy of scale and we've distributed it because, even with a subsidy of Mr. D at the moment, but less and less as time goes on, uh, these make economic sense. Uh, and of course, we gain something as well. We gain robustness. Um, centralized form of anything is inherently a vulnerable node in any system. If you've got distributed forms of anything, um, then it's more robust. If the town laundry goes down, everybody's clothes are dirty for a fortnight. If your washing machine breaks, you can knock on your next door neighbour and if they're kind, they'll let you wash your clothes there and nobody else in town knows anything about. Well, what about the future? At the moment, you and me, every member of the proletariat, we all run our own CD pressing plant, um, we all run our own photographic, well, some of these guys. We do run something that looks like that. Um, but we all run our photographic lab, our own photographic lab, most of us on one of these, of course, uh, and we all run our own printing press. Uh, they don't look like those things, uh, they look like the computers that we all have, because all of those operations that used to be done centrally, industrially, are now being imported because we have this machine that will do them all for us. And have it for purposes of communication, most people do, but it turns out that they do these things for us as well. Um, so, 
Given that every member of the proletariat has taken no specific means of production into their own control and their own ownership, um, why not own the means of production of pretty much everything for themselves? Uh, why not take the economies of scale of conventional manufacturing, split it up, distribute it, and move it into the home? Now, that's not going to happen for everything, of course. It'll be a long time before we're 3D printing super tankers. But nonetheless, I can certainly envision a future where a group of 10 families in the village might get together and say, we'll download an open source 3D printable car, electric car, 3D printable car, and print it out for one of those families over the space of, say, a month and a half. Um, with a Toyota then. <laughs> and while we're at it, if we're going to give people the means of production, let's make it a means of production that makes more means of production. So, when you've got one, you can use it to make one and give it to her, when she's got one, she can make one and give it to him, and so on. Um, that way, we've got a mechanism not only for allowing us to take advantage of the distributed robustness of such a system, and also the reduction in cost, um, but we've also uh, got the means to make it self-perpetuating and, 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 and essentially unstoppable. Okay. Um, if you want to know some more, point your phone at that. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much indeed. Do you want to do questions now, Cornelia? Or do you um, want to talk? Well, if people have uh, questions that they want to ask uh, Adrian now, uh, perhaps you could. Uh, but we've got a second speaker, so if you've got a long discussion you want to enter into, perhaps you could wait until yes. uh, we've had both speakers, and then we're going to break for three, three or four short yes, yes. questions. So, down, yes, then we'll stop, yes. yes, yeah. I'll let you field your questions. Okay, okay. okay. So, so the one thing I think you did mention was that um, that perhaps also allowed you to create internal structures within objects. Yes, um, that's true. Which you can't do with milling or injection molding or anything like that. No, you can't. It's true. Well, you sort of can't. Um, uh, I'm sure it's illegal, of course, to make such things out of ivory these days, but you may have seen caged birds in an ivory cage, which have been very skillfully carved through the bars by a human being. You can do that more crudely with cutting machines, but it's very difficult to make internal structures with, with that technology. Um, um, but uh, yes. 3D printing, of course, because it's working by layers, when the thing is half built, you've essentially got a cavity which is going to be closed over at the top, uh, but which nonetheless you can start building stuff in so that it's perfectly tenable. There's, there's a design actually on the web for it, which is just a simple referee whistle, um, which prints, including the P on the inside. Now, of course, the P is necessarily attached to something by a little store when it's printed, but all you do is you just put a screwdriver through the slot of the whistle and knock it off, and then you've got a whistle with a P in it. Yeah. One of the symptoms of an industrial change happening, like you described, is the existing industry fighting back. So you saw the red flag that stopped the cars going yeah, across. Yeah, you saw what the music industry tried to do to stop the download industry yeah, happening. Indeed, yes. Have you seen any signs yet with respect to rep and ilk of industry fighting back? One extremely polite one, uh, which was no problem at all. And that's it. Uh, what happened when we started the project? Uh, the process that RepRap uses, uh, which I'm happy to describe in detail, if people want me to later on, I'll go into it now, uh, is a process that, uh, in engineering terms, is called FDM, which is short for Fused Deposition Modeling. Um, and it turns out, I wasn't aware of this, I just thought it was a term, uh, but it turns out that that's actually a trademark term owned by one of the big 3D printing companies. And we use the phrase FDM all over our open source website. And they sent us a really nice email saying, we wonder if you would mind most awfully not using our trademark term all over your website. And we sent them back an equally nice email saying, yes, of course, we'll, we'll, we won't use that term, and we'll never use it again. Uh, so we invented our own term. We coined another term for exactly the same thing, which we call Fuse Film Fabrication. We open source the term, if you can open source the term, so anybody can use it for anything like a dictionary work, and then just did a global edit on our website, and uh, problem solved. And that's the only time we've ever had any difficulty is what server and it wasn't really good. So no, nobody's fought back yet.
you not think that the um, the current backlash against 3D printer stuff that's going on in the US with printing your own weapons might actually be a side effect of that? I might be. I just want to be particular because of course every manufacturing technology and manager ever come up with we used, we used to make weapons. There's nothing new about that. Uh, of course, the, the actual weapon that was 3D printed <laughs> was useless. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you make a much better one with a bit of plumbers pipe, a hammer and a nail. Um, uh, literally true. <coughs> and the other thing to remember, just in terms of the, the weapon thing, is we've had lathes, well, lathes existed since before the Industrial Revolution, but we've had proper metal pen lathes for 300 years. Anyone can iron one, anyone can own a lathe, and you can make a really serious weapon with a lathe. Uh, so the idea that this is a special technology in that regard is, is nonsense, of course. Mm. Um, it's just human nature. I've just seen a lot of. Um stories about people um, lobbying for control of this technology. Yes. And I'm guessing that's probably happened, again, like I say, with every game-changing technology that's sort of come along with it. Well, yes, of course. Uh, it's a bit difficult to see. I mean, there's one thing for lobbying for control of technology. It's difficult to go from that point actually to having laws. Mm. And of course, once you've got a law, it's then difficult to enforce. I mean, every country on Earth, I, I, I'm neutral good or bad side of this, but I'm simply going to describe the situation that we currently live in with and will be with the future, which is this. Every country on Earth, more or less, has got laws of copyright. Uh, nobody who, who ever had music downloads uh, ever took any notice of them. Every 17-year-old on the planet has got 20 gigabytes of illegal MP3s on their hard drive. Um, there's no point in passing laws which you can't enforce. Mm. If you've got a technology that copies itself, that anybody can use in their spare bedroom, you can't make laws against that, really. It doesn't work. So. In, in terms of precision and resolution, yeah. what, what are the challenges? Uh, making it better, though it's not something I'm particularly concerned with. I, and certainly, the, the resolution of a red machine is about 100 microns. You can make things to about that accuracy, um, which is about 10 times worse than the machining process that I described. Typically, that will work to about 10 microns of accuracy, though you can get more accurate with the cutting machine. Um, uh, broadly speaking, you can make the technology more accurate if you're prepared to miniaturize it and not make such big things. Um, now, there's a limit, of course, to that. But nonetheless, if you make a smaller machine, it's easier to make it more accurate than if you make a bigger machine. And you've got another interesting thing that happens as soon as you do that. You say, well, hang on, I want to make these things. That's no use. I want to make big, accurate things. The thing I mentioned about if you've got an object that you want to make, you chop it up and make it in pieces and then put it together, really comes into play with small, accurate machines, particularly when they copy themselves. Because, of course, if you can copy the machine a number of times, you can do all that making parallel very easily. Indeed. I haven't mentioned it before, but I run a company based on this technology. We sell the machines. Uh, when we decide we need more production capacity, we stop selling the machines and we put some more together, as opposed to shipping them out the door. And then suddenly our production capacity is increased. Um, very, very simple thing to do. Um, but yeah, they're not as accurate as conventional manufacturing. Yeah, that's certainly true. Perhaps one more. Thank you. 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 Thank you.